And now to get everything going, our first panel, as I mentioned, Medical Analysis and Injury Prevention, will be moderated by Buster Olney. I think most people here know Buster's a senior writer for ESPN.com. He's also on the radio. He's on TV. Um, he works with ESPN, the magazine. He's a reporter for Sunday Night Baseball, analyst for Baseball Tonight. Buster joined ESPN in 2003 to cover baseball. Previously, he had worked for the San Diego Union, the Baltimore Sun, the New York Times. Buster's the author of The Last Night of the Yankee Dynasty, The Game, the Team, and the Cost of Greatness. And with that, I'd like to introduce Buster Olney and our first panel. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I want to introduce you to the panel. Uh, at the end, sitting down first, uh, Stan Conte, Dr. Stan Conte, the Vice President of Medical Services for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Clearly, in the way that he's dressed, he does not intend to become a sports writer. Uh, Dr. Glenn Fleissig, at the end, he's the Research Director, American Sports Medicine Institute. And Chris Marinick, the Vice President for Major League Baseball, League Economics and Strategy. And I got a chance to talk to each one of, uh, each one of these guys the last couple days. They've got a lot of passion, as you can imagine, and we're going to have time at the end for you guys to ask questions, so you know, just keep that in mind as we go here. I, I, you basically got a cheat sheet of different things that they might want to hit on, and I was going to throw this question out to these guys about uh, preventing pitcher injuries. Last year, we saw Matt Harvey of the Mets. By, according to the current standard of how a lot of teams are handling pitchers, the Mets handled them absolutely perfectly in terms of the innings limits, in terms of the pitch counts, and he blew out, and he needs Tommy John surgery. And I mentioned to these guys that in the aftermath of that, I had conversations with a number of different uh, club executives where their thought was, you know what? Maybe the whole thing about the innings limits is not something that we should worry about quite so much. I had a couple of executives say, the one thing we do know is we have these players under control for six years in the major leagues. Maybe we shouldn't abuse them, but we should pitch them. And a couple of examples that were brought up, Tim Lincecum uh, with the Giants, who came in through a lot of innings early in his career. And obviously, when you look back at it, the Giants got a lot of return. And another example was Chris Sale of the White Sox. I had a general manager tell me that his team passed on Chris Sale in the draft, uh, and the White Sox actually drafted him intending for him to be a closer, and now he's one of the best starting pitchers in baseball, despite all those uh, odd mechanics and herky-jerky angles and things that make uh, folks like these guys cringe a little bit. So I wanted to throw that to you guys, that, that idea that, you know what, maybe innings limits is not the way to go. Yeah, well, I think, I think uh, first of all, uh, we should talk a little bit about the injuries that occur and the number of injuries that occur, especially on the UCL or the, the Tommy John surgery, um, and how prevalent it is, or whether it's going up or down. <clears throat> and uh, in reviewing some of that, we found that uh, the Tommy John surgery has been pretty consistent in the major leagues in, re in regards to number of surgeries performed on major league players per year up until 2012, where it sort of doubled for one year, but has come back down. So there's about 20 to 22. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 18 to about 20 uh, pitchers that undergo Tommy John surgery per year. And that has been actually fairly steady over the years up until 2012. Um, and I, I think I'll turn it over to, to Glenn in regards to the mechanics and the, the stresses on the ligament that, that make it uh, an injury that occurs in throwing and pitching. Okay, thanks, Dan. Is this on? Is it on? You gotta hit the there you go. Okay. All right. Um, so let's, let's talk, go back to the pitch count and inning limits things. Um, we've done a lot of statistical study, Buster. I told you about that and taught everyone about this before, that we did a statistical study of youth and high school pitchers. And there's definitely a strong statistical relationship between which high school kids end up having surgery and how many innings they pitched. But now for the professional level, pitch counts and inning limits is just one factor. So, you know, in the press we like to say, is this the thing, is this the all or nothing thing? But I don't think pitch counts and inning limits can tell you 100% who's going to get hurt, but I don't think it should be thrown away. It's, it's a, an important part of the factor of the equation. As Stan just mentioned, pitching mechanics are important also. In other words, two, two major league guys who are six foot four, 210 pounds, who both throw 100 pitches, 
that might be a different amount of stress on the two guys depending on the quality of their mechanics. Uh, so the, the guy with good mechanics, that 100 pitches is, a, is less stressful than the guy with the, with the bad mechanics. So pitch, mechanic, pitch counts and inning limits should be used in analytics and in Sabre, but it's only one part of the equation. The, the other part is not just what you guys do, but what Stan does, because if a guy throws 100 pitches and then comes into the uh, training room and he feels good, that's important feedback for the team to know, versus a guy who comes in after throwing 100 pitches and he has to be ice and he's sore and takes longer. In the next few days, maybe Stan could go back on that. But basically, just counting mathematically is not the whole picture because these are real people. These are not math equations. And different people react differently. And so I think pitch counts and inning limits should be like a guideline at the professional level. But then you get the feedback from the, the medical staff and figure out who could do a little more and who could do a little less. I, I think you're absolutely right that, that pitch counts themselves uh, in and of themselves really don't tell us much. We look at changes in pitch counts in different ways. And when you start drilling down other than the 100 pitches, which we're still trying to figure out where it was 100 pitches. And uh, I can date it back to that book in, I think, 1989, Diamond Appraise, Appraisal, where uh, Tom House was talking about 100 pitches on a young pitcher as a, as a limit, and somehow that caught on. Well, one of the things that happens from a conditioning standpoint is if you train a pitcher to throw 80 pitches per game and then ask him to throw 110, that's a problem. So as we go forward with these things, we look at different changes in that. And then when you talk to pitchers, they talk about stressful innings. And we have to define stressful innings. A stressful innings a 30-pitch inning. Well, pitchers themselves, when you ask them, they actually talk about stressful innings as first and, first and third and no outs, bases loaded, no outs, bases loaded, one out. And whether or not that puts more stress on their, their anatomy, not just their head, but their anatomy, the pitchers would say, yes, it does. So we're starting to look at um, you know, uh, leverage indexes in, in regards to pitchers that, are, that you can find in the sabermetric world and seeing if there's some correlation between high stress innings based on uh, possible run production and those type of things. So it's not as simple as that, as just the, 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 the pitch counts themselves. Stan, how do you define that? <clears throat> when you talk about leverage innings and you're defining it for the Dodgers. Well, we're actually doing a bunch of research right now looking at this. We, we looked at stressful innings as a, a pitch count of, say, over 23 per inning and how those came. And we saw no correlation with that. Um, and what usually happens in the major leagues is if a guy has, a, has two innings of 30 pitches each, he's usually out of the game because there's a reason he's throwing 30 pitches. He's not very good that day. So they don't end up with total pitch counts. When we looked at the stressful innings, we didn't see that. Leverage index is a new fascinating one uh, that we're just looking at the data to see if pitchers that have more stress innings or high le leverage innings in a season have a tendency to be injured more. Uh, but it also gets into the whole aspect of, of merging baseball statistics with medical and, and seeing whether they're injured or not. Yeah, the one, the one thing I'll add to all that from a league-wide perspective or an you know, MLB perspective is that, and, and this is the reason why I think this is really neat that we have this panel to, to kick off the conference here, is that injury research, medical research, I think is, is relatively at its stages of infancy, especially relative to all the things you guys normally talk about at a Sabre conference, you know, um, offensive statistics, defensive statistics, things like that. Analysis in those areas are much, much more mature than where we are in the injury space for a variety of reasons. Um, and you guys may have you know, seen quotes from Billy Bean and others that say that inju injury research is the next frontier of analytics in baseball. And I think that's really true. We don't have a lot of good understanding. And you can hear just some of, from some of these answers. It's people are trying new ideas. There's no strict guidelines. There's not a lot of formal rules that, that are in place around you know, injuries. There's not a you know, pitch count limit that you should use. I think people are starting to realize that. Um, and so I think this, that's why this is really interesting. It'll be, it'll, it'll be a, a good area for innovation and new insights over the next you know, five or 10 years in baseball. Chris, you designed uh, the medical record system that is now used by baseball. Can you talk about that and what your inspiration was? Yeah, so that's, that's actually one of the reasons why I think we're going to have a lot of innovation in this area in the next couple of years. I, I actually joined MLB in 2008, um, and I was like, shocked to see that we didn't have 
a system for tracking injury or medical information, um, you know, at a de-identified level across the industry. We, we were literally keeping a lot of records in paper documents and putting them into a filing cabinet, you know? And then when you're traded, you know, the documents go in the trash or they have to, you have to FedEx them to the new team. And it was just a, a nightmare in terms of, of exchanging information, one, for research, but two, just for the, own, the player's own medical care and the player's health, you know, getting information to the people that needed it. And so um, I, I just, you know, one of the big things that came up in working with Stan and, and the athletic trainers, um, you know, across the industry was, hey, it's time for us to get into the 21st century here. And so um, starting in the 2010 season, we rolled out an electronic medical record system working with the Players Association um, that, that allows our medical staff to enter in information on every single player injury and the treatments that those players get. Um, and then that information is all stored in one place. And so when you, you go from one team to the next, it, fo it flows along with you. And so, um, you know, you're getting to the, we were getting to the point where we have guys who have been in baseball now for a long time and we actually have, you know, an extensive medical record over a five, ten year period on what, what has happened to these guys so that we can treat them better and we can keep them healthy. Um, and the ancillary benefit of all that is that we also have uh, an injury tracking system where we, we can track trends in the industry of what are the most common injuries, how many collisions do we have at home plate, how many concussions do we have, you know, how many UCL surgeries do we have, things like that. And we can do that at a de-identified level and work with, you know, the Players Association, some of our medical researchers to start doing analysis of you know, what are the drivers of lost time and injuries and things that are keeping players off the field so that we can hopefully, you know, keep them healthier and keep them on the field longer. Chris, I just want to back this up. I, actually, someone with a team mentioned to me once that literally pre your system, you were completely at the mercy of how uh, thorough a, a trainer was, a team doctor was, that there literally were some teams where the, if the trainer, athletic trainer, the doctor didn't write something down, you had nothing to work with, is that accurate? Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, it's the same thing if you go to a hospital, right? Or at least five years ago when you go to a hospital. Some doctors, you know, do a thorough write-up and give you a, a full evaluation, and other doctors just say, great, thanks for coming in, you know, come back in two weeks. Um, and so that's a little bit of an exaggeration, obviously, but, you know, care was very different from team to team, and not only care, but just the way it was tracked and, and recorded. And so, you know, I'm, again, I'm not a medical guy, but you know, Stan might write it down one way and Glenn might write it down a way that's completely different even though it's the same exact issue. And so what we, we worked a lot with the athletic trainers and the doctors on were a standardized system of recording information so that you can then analyze it and it's apples to apples. Um, you know, we, we created an environment where it, it's just conducive to being able to track information and report on information so that players can, we can get information on, on players that we need. Stan, you you might, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Stan. Well, I think one of the, one, part of the topic of this, this panel is prevention. And I, uh, it was amazing in, in to the 2000, decade of the 2000s, uh, when Chris came on, we were talking about preventing injuries. People, a, a team would say, well, we prevented hamstring injuries. And I said, well, how many hamstring injuries did you have the year before? Well, we don't know. Well, if you didn't know, how do you know if you prevented them? I mean, simple, simple yeah. things. That was all the way up to 2010. And one of the things that we're doing now that we have the HIT system is, is really getting a foundational database of what happens. We know how many hamstring injuries occur. We know that we've studied these things. We know how long they, they generally take and how, how, what the re-injury rate is. Five years ago, we were, we were throwing darts at a, bo a board. So this is really, really important now, and, and you know, and when you, just to follow up on prevention, you know, the the best way to treat an injury is to prevent it. Mm -hmm. At Major League Baseball level, at the professional level, the best way to treat an injury is not to buy it. So this also works in, in the other other way of having information, so you can evaluate players that you think are going to chance chance to stay healthy over the upcoming years of the contract of the of the uh, of the player. Chris, you mentioned trends, uh, and you'll be able to see some trends. In general terms, what types of things are you seeing since you've had this information in front of you? Yeah, it's interesting. So we, you know, one of the first things we realized is that, um, you know, hamstrings are, are some of the most prevalent injuries in baseball, but they're all, you know, it's not one of the most t the longest time missed injuries. What we, what we quickly realized, and this might seem obvious to people now, but is that pitcher injuries are the most significant injuries in baseball. People talk a lot about position players getting hurt or, you know, ha having issues with, with a hitter, but the most significant in, in terms of time loss injuries are pitcher injuries, things like elbows and shoulders. Um, those are injuries where a lot of times you miss half a season or a whole season. And so 
you know, the 80-20 rule, focusing on those injuries are the injuries that I think are going to be the most helpful to clubs and to players is, is focusing on, you know, pitcher injuries. Focusing on, you know, whether we could prevent an outfielder from colliding into the wall and having a freak incident might not be the best use of our time. Obviously, it's not helpful to the player for that to happen, but, you know, there's not, some of these things just happen. It's not like football where, you know, we have tons of injuries in every single game, and if we can avoid collisions or contact, that really makes a big difference. The thing in baseball that makes a big difference is avoiding injuries to pitchers on, on throwing issues in particular. I know from talking with Stan and with Glenn that you guys, uh, you both mentioned how there's just so much misperception about Tommy John surgery. Uh, Stan and I asked you, I said, well, where, where does that come from? And he kind of looked at me like, well, you guys. Uh, <laughs> As you know, how many times have you read that phrase where you hear about someone coming back from Tommy John surgery? Well, they're better than ever. They throw harder than ever. I know, Glenn, you have some stories yeah, sure. from amateur uh, parents along those lines. Sure. Well, actually, we, you know, with Dr. Andrews, I'm the PhD doctor. He's the medical doctor. And uh, we see uh, pitchers who are high school pitchers or two major league pitchers who come in for surgery. And sure enough, some of them are throwing with better ball velocity a year after their surgery than a year before the surgery. And, and frankly, it was a, like a, even like a joke in some of the teams that uh, the, 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 the uh, veteran players were saying, hey, rookie, you need to get one of these scars here. It'll make you pitch faster. And um, so uh, they were kind of messing with some of the rookies in Major League Baseball. But, um, but so the truth is, statistically, some pitchers do pitch faster a year after their surgery than a year before the surgery. But if you think about it, what's happening there? Dr. Andrews and the other doctors didn't put anything magic in. They just tried to make it as good as it was, the original parts, as good as God gave them their arm. But what's happened is, if you compare who they were a year before their surgery, maybe they weren't 100% who they should have been. Maybe they were injured or, or partly injured before, a year before surgery. The other thing is, after the surgery, the, the surgeon does some of the work, but then the physical therapist and the, and the pitcher do a lot of the work. So a lot of times, a year after the surgery, the uh, pitcher is in better physical shape than he's ever been. Another factor is, uh, we're talking about pitch counts and stuff, why did they get hurt in the first place? Well, it could be their mechanics. It could also be how much they pitched. When they have surgery and then a rehab program, that's kind of a forced vacation, and they have to, their whole body has to stop pitching by definition. They've had the surgery and everything. So it's not, a, it's not the surgery alone that makes them a better pitcher a year later. It's, it's the rest, the rehab exercises, maybe reanalyzing the mechanics, and, uh, and, that, you know, and we're very proud that a lot of times they do as well as they've ever done. Yeah, I think, too, though, we have, to, we have to look at really the stats directly in regards to major league pitchers, not high school and uh, college, but major league pitchers. And there's, there's two very interesting studies that have just come out in the medical literature looking at performance after Tommy John and, and velocity after Tommy John. And uh, basically the, the, the idea is that they come generally back to where they were Correct. before the injury, which is the objective of the surgery. Okay, they don't generally statistically come back at a higher velocity. In fact, the study that we just finished, um, we haven't published yet, but it shows that, that at least during their first year, they, re they reduced about three quarters of miles per hour on the average. That doesn't mean that there's one or two that the media wants to highlight that, that, that uh, uh, doesn't increase his velocity from where he was before. The other thing that's really important in this, and, and you know, although I concentrate on professional athletes, uh, where Glenn works a lot with high school and college, um, there was a recent study that was ca came out that did a survey of parents and coaches uh, asking them what they thought about Tommy John surgery. And about 38% to 42% of the coaches and the parents thought it was okay to do a Tommy John surgery on, on their son, or son mm -hmm. that did not have an elbow problem in order to improve performance. This is dangerous stuff, and, yep. and Dr. Andrews talks about this all the time, where the guy, the, the parents come in and say, listen, he's throwing 78, he's not going to get a scholarship till he throws 83, let's do the surgery so he can throw 83. This sounds ridiculous, but it's happening on a global scale. It's ridiculous. And so some of the information has to come out. We plan on doing a survey uh, similar to what was done before, but we're doing it with the media to find out if what they actually think about Tommy John surgery and their myths. Stan, can you detail some of the, what you consider, you mentioned to me the other day, the inherent risks in Tommy John surgery and then having it a second time. I mean, what are the percentages of success rate? Actually, uh, we, we did a study, if I may. Okay. We did a study of 1,000 
about 1,000 pictures. We got 800 for follow-up from Dr. Andrews' experience in his clinic. And uh, from professional down to youth, I'm, I'm doing it off the top of my head, but professional down to youth, about 85% of them return to the same level. And on average, they get to this, back to the same level in about 12 months. And frankly, they're statistically as good as they were at about a year and a half. So they cut back at 12 months, but the first half year, they're not as good. So again, that's good for the 85%. That's not good for the 15% who don't make it. But the other question is, you know, what's the shelf life of the surgery? If you're 34 years old and have a Tommy John surgery, and then you get uh, four or five more years in, then it was worth it. If you're 17 years old and come to our clinic, and Dr. Andrews or whoever says, you don't need surgery, it's kind of a partial tear, and they're like, oh, please, you know, I want the surgery, which is kind of a weird situation. But anyway, when they do have a surgery, because they had it to have it, uh, you know, they are good a year later, two years later, but what's the shelf life of that? You know, Tommy John surgery is still kind of new, and a after about five years, you know, your body has accepted it as a replacement, but after time, your body starts to have trouble, whether it's a Tommy John surgery of a baseball player or an ACL surgery of a, of a knee of a football player. Uh, after time, the body is not 100% happy with it often. Let me just follow up. First of all, in that study, which was a great study, a long-term study, uh, when you looked at major league pitchers, however, it was about 74% return, mm -hmm. which means one out of four did not even return. Now, the new studies that are out are talking about performance that comes back, uh, that these guys do, in fact, return to their previous level of performance based on certain metrics, WHIP, ERA, that type of thing. Um, but it seems to be the second year, which almost everyone intuitively thinks the second year is better than the first year. So I think one of the things, and, and also in that last study, the major league pitchers returned in about 16 months, not 12 months. The only reason I bring this up is because this, this concept drifts upward to the front office, okay? And it drifts up so that a player comes back in 11 months and he comes back throwing harder than he did before. That's the expectations of the organization. And when they come back at 13 months, that's two months too late. And it really does make a huge difference uh, in the timings of the surgery and everything else when you're, when you're saying it's absolutely true that 100% people come back and they come back at 12 months. In fact, that is just not true at the major league level, okay? A college pitcher can come back at a different level. If a major league player comes back and is down 5 or 6% from where he was before, he doesn't get it on a team. So there's a totally different thing in regards to the major leagues and the professional ranks than you, than you see in, in other, other areas. And the one thing that kind of Stan brought up, which I think is important to point out, is that one of the reasons why this area is very difficult is that you have front office people, general managers, who are in charge of um, finding insights in the information or working with their medical people to find the insights. The GMs and the, and the front office people are not medical people. So inherently, it's very difficult for them to understand some of these concepts. They're used to other ideas where, or other areas where it's, okay, you're back in 12 months or it's, it's a black and white thing and they get upset when, when you don't hit a benchmark. That's not how medicine works. I mean, medicine is inherently individual oriented and it, and it varies from one person to the next based on a whole variety of factors. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons why, you know, it's gonna take some time to get people used to how this works and, and what some of the research is because it's not, you know, it's, it's very scientific by nature. It's trial and error, it's experimentation. It's one, one person to the next are, can be very different. And so I think we just need to kind of get that you know, out there in terms of, of baseball people and the fans as well. Before we move on, we just saw Chris Medlin get injured. It looks like he's going to have a second Tommy John surgery. What do your numbers say about someone in that situation? Well, par part of the problem is, uh, fortunately, there hasn't been a ton right. of those players. Correct. Uh, so you have very small sample sizes. You know, we had uh, 2013, I mean, 2012 was a unbelievable year on, on Tommy John because they had seven revisions. We went back to 1991, we could only find 17 major league pitchers that had come back from re revision second Tommy Johns. And there were seven done. You know, one of them ended up on our team, Brian Wilson. Uh, and we've tracked these guys in regards to two things. One is how long between their first and their second. The reason we're gonna see more revisions in, in, in the major leagues is because the surgery is so successful. These guys are having their surgeries when they're 18 and 19 years old. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they're good enough to get back and get drafted and move up through the minor leagues and actually get to the major leagues. Now, in, in the two that we were tracking, remember these are, you know, you guys know this a lot better than I, it's a very small sample size. But we were looking at Soria and Wilson and they both were about eight or nine years apart from their first Tommy John. 
So we categorize these revisions, these second Tommy Johns, into two categories. One's that, that last a long time, meaning seven, eight, nine years, and we'll, we won't know for a long time how long they really last, but we're looking at that. And then the guys who fail one to two years out, uh, like Hudson uh, for, um, uh, for the Diamondbacks. Uh, the, the ones that fail um, early is probably just a failure of the surgery itself um, and or the rehab that uh, accompanies it. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, but, but uh, uh, so you, we're looking at that. When a player does come back from the, s the second Tommy John, it definitely takes longer to get back, so we're looking at 16 or 18 months before they get back. Uh, and then we look very closely at their velocities uh, as they come back before we look at them. The, the, the answer to the question is, it looks like they come back at a pretty good rate in regards to the second one, but again, it's still pretty early in that. You guys know that uh, a lot of teams now are looking more and more at pitch FX data, and, and in terms of preventing injuries, mm. Glenn, when I asked you about this the other day, I mean, you jumped on it, because it sounds like you have some mixed feelings. Not, okay. Yeah, so actually, um, Chris was just saying, uh, he's talking about Billy Bean, and the next thing might be the prevention of uh, pitching injuries and the medical stuff. Uh, it's, it's interesting you bring him up. I'm going to circle back to this, but back in 2002, not only were the uh, A's doing the on-base percentage and all that stuff, but they were also starting to get into biomechanics, which is, part, which is related to this, about the pitching mechanics and what happens. And, um, and we did uh, Barry Zito and Tim Hudson and couple of these up-and-coming pitchers at the time, and we looked at their biomechanics. And so on-base percentages and, and for pitchers, whip and all that stuff, and even radar guns are part of the statistics of what someone does. Now, PitchFX and TrackMan, both these things, are now giving you, us, more information about what the pitch is doing. Besides the velocity of the pitch, it's saying where did the pitch move, where was it released from, how much did it curve or spin, and that is useful information as well from performance point of view. But going back to what we started with Billy Bean and which we're doing now with a lot of teams is you got to look at what the person's body's doing and that's what biomechanics is and that's what I've been doing for 25, 27 years. And so the biomechanics means what is the mechanics of the, the biology of the person's body. So my, my point buster and everybody is that um, it's tracking where the ball went and, and that pitchers who are getting hurt release it from over here versus over here or pitchers who strike it out release from over here versus over here. That's good, but how did their body get there? When did they uh, open their elbow, extend their elbow? When did they rotate their shoulder? How much force was it? So the new thing, you know, you're talking about what's happening in baseball, and I know behind the scenes, having worked with many of the teams, the new thing that's happening is teams are embracing biomechanics. Let's look at the pitcher's body in addition, in addition to just looking at the ball. And so what we're doing with you know, I can't disclose which teams, but about half the teams is we're looking at the mechanics, the biomechanics of, uh, the, of some of the pitchers and to see uh, not only where is the ball moving, but does he have more force on his arm than he does and does he have better mechanics as using his whole body. So that, that's why when we, you and I talked the other day, I, I like pitch, pitch FX and track man. It's adding more information than just the radar gun. My hesitation is for people to think that's the end all of everything. Uh, that's just more information about the outcome of the ball that we still have to understand what the person's body's doing. Stan? Well, um, I think I look at it differently. Uh, first of all, when you get a signature biomechanical analysis, which I think is important, and I think it would behoove every team to do that, uh, um, the next part is what do you do with that information? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and at the major league level, at the minor league level, I think it's probably going to be more valuable than at the major league level um, because it's difficult to change people's mechanics with the success they've had and they've passed the Darwin test of coming through the minor leagues with no injuries. And then can you change those mechanics? I think that the, the pitch FX and track man uh, add additional information. We, we don't look at where the ball goes. We look at changes in the data. A change is not a good thing. Uh, if you you know, if you think about efficiency in pitchers, it's consistency of delivery. I mean, in other words, can they reproduce their delivery every time? Not only is that best effectiveness, effectiveness uh, in regards to pitching, I'll use Maddox as the, the prime example of that, but, but it also is the most efficient on their body. So we look at any differences that happen. If we start to see changes in some of the pitch FX data, 
Um, uh, and we're looking, for instance, if we're looking at another player from previous year and we're looking to sign them, if I see changes in that performance data, including pitch FX, including velocity, including usage, um, then, then that is a red flag for me to look at different areas that that guy may be changing something due to an impending or, or an injury that's occurring at that time. So it's a little bit different than what Glenn's talking about. You know, and I, I couldn't say enough about biomechanics and the importance of biomechanics, uh, but the other ones I would tell you are just as important, uh, especially since the data is so new, uh, as we delve into it more and look at it and then actually relate it to injuries. Uh, and this is where, where this whole prediction and probability of injuries gets messed up, is we have all this great data, but we haven't applied it to who gets hurt and who doesn't get hurt. We, use, we do like a lot of things in baseball is we use anecdotal, you know, this guy was good and this guy threw this way or this guy did that. So uh, again, across the whole board, I think it's going to be more important to look at this data to see those changes, if they're normal or they're not normal or what happens when a guy changes. Velocity is the best one. I mean, it's the most gross one. A guy drops two miles per hour from last year. Do you want to give him $10 million? I'm not so sure I do. So. But, uh, let me, sorry, if I can I add to that? I totally agree, agree with you that pitch FX is very valuable because it's very accessible, Stan. Every, the teams have it, and to see how the pitch changed, the velocity and the location, that's, that's important information, those changes. Um, unfortunately, we're at the point where biomechanics is not being collected every uh, pitch. The technology is not there, but when we come back 10 years from now in our hovercrafts or whatever, however we come <laughs> to our meeting, um, at, at some point, it might not be 10 years from now, it might be two years from now. We need to, and we will be, having the technology to collect the biomechanics of the pitcher in the game. Because as you pointed out, we get like a baseline biomechanics, whether the Dodgers or someone else in a preseason, and say, here's his mechanical flaws. But is he changing over the course of time? Is the coach working with him? So yes, pitch FX is really good because we have it now. But I, I envision a future where biomechanics will also be the feedback that you and the teams could be getting uh, in game. Yeah, and we're, we're using, I mean, I th again, you know, you may not know it, but Glenn and I are actually good friends. So <laughs> we have strong, yeah. strong uh, opinions about these things. I, I think we look at on rehabs, on guys who go back into rehab, uh, especially using TrackMan or something else, uh, along with PitchFX, uh, we use their baseline when they were healthy. And w as they're going through rehab games and, and moving themselves back, we look at those to see if those numbers start to coincide with what they had before. So. Yeah, I, th I think you know, one thing to point out that these guys have kind of covered already, though, is, is that a lot of the innovation in this space is happening in private, so to speak, or at the club level, rather than at the public level. Um, and so, you know, whereas the other areas of, of Sabre and, and analytics have, have traditionally happened you know, with, with folks in this room or at the public level, because a lot of the data is out in the public domain. And yes, pitch FX data is out there, but as you can hear from these guys, it's, it's, you're limited in what and the relevance of pitch FX data for injuries in particular. Um, a lot of what you need to, to do this analysis is stuff that happens at the player level and at the club level, either through biomechanical surveys or just you know, your club saying, I want to try two different you know, stretching programs out. Group one does this program, group two does another program, and let's see how it works. You know, more of an experimentation type thing. And so those things are a little more difficult to replicate, you know, into the public domain. I think, you know, Glenn's right. I think technology will help facilitate that over the long run. But um, for now, we're sort of working on a smaller scale, which I think is one of the, you know, impediments to massive change, massive innovation, is that there's just, we can't get it in the hands of enough people um, to really have those innovations yet. You guys have all talked about and recognize it's a room for growth. What's got to happen to make that happen? Well, I think... One of the things you're seeing, we're talking about TrackMan, um, and, and some of you who were at MIT last week uh, heard from MLB.com that they're doing a lot more with regards to player tracking and more detailed tracking of player movements. I think that's going to be a big step forward, uh, is just you know, in terms of making some of that information more publicly available. I think someone said that um, a game's worth of data in that system is seven terabytes just for one game. So you're talking about big data at a massive scale. Um, and so it's really going to be about how do you get that out into the public domain and into a form that people can use to create insights on. I think today it's just too big and too complicated to figure out, but you know, three years from now it probably won't be. And so that'll be a big, a big change, I think, first of all. Um, second of all, it, this area is a little tough too because 
you know, has the one unique issue of, of the fact that it's medical information and it's a, a, a person's private information. So I'm not sure that you're going to get the same public access, you know, that you, you're used to getting from offensive data, defensive data, whatever. I mean, this is, this is someone's medical history. I mean, none of us would want our medical histories posted online for everyone to see. And so I think, you know, we're, we're pretty cautious about how we protect that information for players because it's important to them. And, and you don't want someone's private information being posted on the internet. It's, it's one thing if it's, you know, did the guy have a surgery or not, or, or some of those types of things. But if it's, it's something personal, you know, that's, that's probably not gonna make it out there. And so we have to, I think over the next couple of years, we'll start to navigate those waters a little bit in terms of having some technological improvements as well as figuring out how to get some of these things into the public domain. But it's a little bit more complicated. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's, it's kind of lagging a little bit. Yeah, I think that you're absolutely right about the medical histories, which is the, the biggest factor in regards to injury prediction or probability of future injury. And, and is, is that typically when I look at a player uh, that we're looking to sign, say, as a free agent or something else, uh, I'll use public domain information to get as much information as I can uh, to give myself some idea whether that guy is a low risk or a medium risk or a high risk in regards to injuries. Uh, and then uh, if we then in fact uh, do a physical and look at his medical records that when we're about to sign them, the whole thing may flip. It may flip completely from one end of the spectrum to the other on things that we didn't know about or things that added up to some of the public stuff that made it, made it a higher risk or even a lower risk. So that, that really is a big factor and I think sometimes when I read some of the sabermetric articles about, about injuries and that type of thing, it's, and, and sometimes it's on our players. I go, geez, if they knew that, they wouldn't say that. But, but they don't, and that's some of the issues. Yeah. Go ahead, Glenn. Yeah. And, and I think some of the things that are going to happen are, again, with this pitching mechanics, with the biomechanics, more and more of the coaches, you know, I wish you were right. I wish uh, it was more in the public information, but the teams are very competitive and secretive. Uh, and then a lot of teams come to us and, and to other places and get biomechanical evaluation. So it's actually happening, but it's not out there in public. And, and the proof is, um, for all these things, is that you know pitchers are still getting injured, but there are more and more pitchers pitching at a higher velocity. So something good is happening medically or mechanically, and, and baseball is making some good steps to help these uh, athletes optimize their performance. Uh, and, and I think what's going to happen now, from a mechanical point of view, is more and more coaches are are understanding and embracing what this stuff means and, and using it. And as Stan pointed out, it's mostly at the minor league development level because that's really where you get to, uh, to tweak the, the pitchers and make them who they can be, whereas in the major league level, it's more like uh, maintain and keep them there. A lot of college programs will train their pitchers to throw harder. And you guys, you mentioned, Glenn, the velocities are going up. And I thought of this story when Chuck Yeager was a test pilot. Uh, there was initial thought before he broke the sound barrier that if he went through the sound barrier that his plane would disintegrate. And I mentioned this to Glenn yesterday. As we see guys throw harder and harder and harder, is there in baseball uh, physically a sort of a sound barrier as we see guys throw harder and harder? I'll take this because... Uh Someone asked me this like 10 years ago, and I'm like, I don't know, you have me stumped. But then people have asked me this a lot, okay? And uh, so 10 years ago, after I thought about it, I thought about how the, the body works, and I said, you know, I don't know who the high, hardest pitcher was 10 years ago, uh, Joel Zamayo or someone. I said, um, I don't think the limit, the top pitching speed is going to go up. I think it's going to stay 100, 102 miles per hour, but more and more guys are going to get closer to that limit. And I think that's what we've seen over the last 10 years. I don't think... You know, whether other things, whether we just watch the Olympics, the, the swimming or sledding or whatever, the different events, the world records now shatter the records from 20 years ago or 40 years ago. But I don't think today's hardest pitchers shatter what Nolan Ryan did 40 years ago or whatever. But I think more and more pitchers are clumped near the top. Now, now why is that? I, I think the way the human body works is through medical conditioning and mechanics, you can help people optimize who they are, even get stronger. But the weak link will always be people's ligaments and tendons, like their Tommy John ligament or rotator cuff tendons. And unfortunately, or how it, the human body is, um, for medical reasons, you can't really make your ligaments and tendons much stronger. You can make your muscles much stronger. You can make your mechanics better. But your ligaments and tendons, I think they're the limiting factor. And I think this is about as hard as a human body can pitch, give or take a couple of miles per hour. I don't. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm going to be ignorant on this one because I should know the answer, but I don't know that velocities are increasing 
as a general average. Uh, and I don't even think max velocities are, 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 are increasing. Probably somebody out there has done the study and I haven't seen it. Um, we definitely see a decrease in velocity as age goes on. But I, I do think there's no question there's a mathematical correlation between velocity and stress on the ligament and the elbow. There's, that's been proven over and over. Yep. Glenn's proven that. Other people have proven that. So a higher velocity puts more stress on that. But we're, we're not talking about a block of wood either. And, and you know a piece of steel. We're talking about the human body that can change, can increase strength. And although 55% of, of the, the force on the elbow is controlled by that ligament, there's other 45% of muscle and bone that also do that. So, so um, you know, I definitely cringe if, our, if we have a pitcher who throws 100 miles an hour. Uh, they usually don't last very long, but I don't know that we've done a study that actually shows that. Uh, we, we tried it one time and we really couldn't find a good correlation between higher velocity and increased injuries. The other thing that needs to be looked at here is that, um, I'm going to say this and there's usually somebody who cringes, but injuries in baseball are going up. Okay, They are going up. They are not going down and they're not staying level. Since 2007, it's been, it's been increasing significantly. The last two years have been the highest amount of lost time in, in Major League Baseball ever in the history of baseball. So we're doing all these great things and we're really working hard at trying to prevent these injuries, uh, but we don't seem to be putting the brakes on either. So, you know, uh, we better figure out something, but uh, some of this research is gonna help a lot. Why do you guys think that is? Uh, and Glenn, I remember having a conversation with you a decade ago and you said one of the reasons potentially was the medicine's gotten better, that you can literally diagnose more things. You mean diag you know, to diagnose and find injuries, yeah. So one thing's over time when they say there's more Tommy John surgery, rotator cuff surgery, and Stan, you could jump in, but basically the diagnosis of it is better. Plus, since the surgery and rehab is more successful, people are more willing to have it done. So, you know, more surgeries doesn't mean there are more injuries. It just me might mean they're being found more and being willing to be treated more. Yeah, I think, I think when it comes to Tommy John surgeries, um, when we have a person who has an elbow pain, a, a, a little pain in the elbow, uh, we're told by non-medical people, just do the surgery. Just get the surgery over, it's 100%. And this gets back to the myth of, of, of that whole thing. What has had been interesting in the last five to six years is, is when you look at shoulder and elbow, there are about 53 to 57% of all the lost time in, uh, at the major league level. Mm. Okay, so, and that makes sense because it's a throwing sport. But it, shoulder has always been ahead of elbow. This is kind of how I think. You know, shoulder is moving ahead and the elbow is doing whatever it's doing. That's actually reversed over the last three years. And now elbows are accounting for more. And that probably is due to the fact that they're doing surgery um, and it takes a year to come back and those are reflected in lost days. But then I fall back on the other part of this and that the number of Tommy John surgeries that are occurring at the major league level has been fairly stable other than 2012. So we should have seen an increased number of Tommy John surgeries if that theory is hold true. I think there's a decrease in the number of lost time in shoulders because shoulder surgeries are not nearly as successful as elbow surgeries. And surgeons now are, are trying to do more things with rehab and conservative care on shoulders than operate. Um, Ten years ago they would operate and the outcomes were not very good. So they've, they've gone away from that. And surgery always takes longer to come back to from than conservative. I think I could have served as your agent the last couple of days. When I talked to teams, uh, Stan, I was, we were talking about the idea that teams are now building their medical departments. And you think about it, I mean, if you make a proper recommendation against signing a guy who's going to make tens of millions of dollars, as one GM said to me, someone doing that, they, they earn their money back in, in tenfold. Um, I'm curious about your process. You got Dodgers out there, they should hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious about your process for evaluating injury risk. And Chris, I'm wondering if teams reach out to you guys for feedback. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Actually, um, it's, it's not just the medical department. It's the baseball operations department now have people with the title medical analyst, medical researcher in baseball operations reporting to the GM or the assistant GM. So five years ago, you never would have seen that. And now you have those things today. Um, and so, yeah, teams are, teams are all the time reaching out to us, asking us questions. Can we do this? Can we do that? How can we do a study? Um, and we help them in terms of facilitating some research. What we focus on at the Major League Baseball level is really more around player health and safety in aggregate. So 
you know, we look at things like concussions and we look at things like, you know, preventing certain types of injuries just for the benefit of players in general, for the benefit of the league in general. Um, but the teams are really focused on how do they help their specific players to, so they can win games. And so that's stuff that they do on their own. You know, we don't get involved in that because they think that we'll tell everybody if they let us know what they're finding out. So, um, but we certainly help facilitate those things. And I think, um, you know, just like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it was the, you know, latest and greatest thing to have a, a stats guy, you know, in your baseball operations department. Now the, the latest thing is to have a medical guy in your baseball operations department. And I think, you know, again, 10 or 15 years from now, you'll see a lot of teams probably have that if they don't have a guy like Stan, you know, on their medical side who's really into this and, and does a lot of research on his own. Well, first of all, yeah, to, uh, to go back to selection of players, which is what you're talking about, there's a risk-reward ratio you have to think of, uh, look at the forest before you look at the trees. And that is that um, if you have a, a lot of times people will take risk on medical because of the high pro possibility of great baseball return. These are guys that, that are coming back from surgeries or doing those type of things. And what is their upside versus their downside? The downside, of course, is he's hurt all year and he can't play if he's a high risk. And the, but the reward could be that way. So we you know, look at high risk, high reward, if you're gonna look at selecting a player. And, and we do kind of go back to the idea that teams are, are uh, players are stocks and, and teams are portfolios and you can put so many high risk guys in that portfolio uh, depending on what type of philosophy you have. But what you don't want is a high risk, low reward guy and sometimes we do that inadvertently, especially at the minor league level, where we're trying to get a scrap heap, uh, I think Dave Cameron coined that phrase, a scrap heap player who has been hurt but is making a comeback as major league experience, and you know you want him as an organizational guy or maybe a guy who'll make your 25th man. So you have to look at that. The other things that we do, you know, we look at different categories of things in regards to when we evaluate risk with a player. Um, medical history is the biggest. Uh, the best predictor of the future is the past. If a guy has a hamstring injury the last three years, has lost 40 days every, week, every year, probably the chance is he's going to have another hamstring injury. That's intuitive. Um, you know, uh, as how, uh, but a hamstring injury comes back in like 20 or 30 days. What about an elbow that's going to be out all year? So we look at that and the, bobby, and the body, body parts that are involved in that. Um, demographics, uh, age, major league service time, um, is, is really big. Contract status is, is a big thing that we look at. Um, and then biometrics, uh, which is uh, some of the things that we actually do in, in the training room, looking at range of motion of certain joints that may indicate a propensity toward injury um, uh, and that type of thing. Baseball, persp uh, baseball performance metrics, changes in that, which includes usage. If a guy was used 80 times as a reliever in the last two years each year, eh, I don't like that guy too much because He's been overused and he's, he's headed down the road for an injury. Um, and, then the, and then the biomechanics, which we look at different things with that. Um, so each category, you kind of drill down to each thing and at the end you have a probability. And, and I think everybody in this room, if they're interested in say Rick, understands probability. You know, if you have a 70% chance of rain, there's a 30% chance it's not better to take an umbrella and, and know what you're in for. And the fact is that that probability over a period of time will in fact play out. So if you have 100 days that are 70%, 70 of those days it probably will rain. It may not rain on those 30 that you pick though. So statistically, you have to look at that and, and, and be able to do that and work your whole team on the medical side. The medical side is really getting important. I mean, we see it all the time. Uh, I mean, I think it, medical, of course, this is my little part of the world, is that medical is as important as the talent you're putting on the field because if you sign a great player and he's sitting next to me on the bench because he's hurt, it really doesn't do us any good. So what, when you get down to the bottom line and you're sitting in the room with the people that you work for, can you explain sort of what the nature of your final recommendation is. If you saw the movie Zero Dark Thirty, they asked all the analysts in the room, 50% probability it's been lost, and 60%, 90%. How do you present that? Well, we, we do it generally as, as a low, uh, low, medium, 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 high, high risk. And, and um, um, then the, the typical question is, okay, you know, can you keep this guy healthy? How long can you, how much do you think he's going to lose? Those kinds of things go back and forth. 
and it's put in, you know, it's put in the same way that the, that the scouting department says, what's the, what's the, that we need this guy to have 75 RBIs. What's his chance of having 75 RBIs? And they'll, they'll present their case of why they think he will or he won't. It's, it's no different. To me, the, the medical is exactly like scouting. It's predicting something that's going to happen based on the numbers that you have. The better numbers you have and the better scouts you have, the better your outcome. We got about 15 minutes left. Let's take some questions. Mm -hmm. Pardon my ignorance on this, um, and it may be a bit controversial, but uh, back in the uh, 2000s, early 2000s, people like Mark McGuire indicated that they were using performance enhancing drugs to recover from injuries or to prevent injuries, which on the surface doesn't sound like a bad idea at all. Is there a common sense approach to this? Well, I think uh, maybe I'll, I'll try to answer that in a different way. I think what we're seeing in the future is uh, uh, PRP, plasma-rich, uh, platelet-rich pla plasma, and stem cells, uh, which uh, are medically uh, used for recovery. Um, um, uh, my stance on performance-enhancing drugs is pretty well known to the public. I'm pretty much against that whole thing. Um, but I think what you're asking is whether performance-enhancing drugs reduced injuries. And, and there's no way to actually know that um, in regards to, to – because uh, you don't know what people were taking or how many people were taking it. Um, and maybe I'll leave it at that so I don't get in trouble. Actually, I want to add a funny little story about that. Uh, um, you know, obviously, steroids uh, are a big issue and a problem in baseball. I have a little funny story about my friend here, Stan, here. Uh, there was a, a baseball player named Barry Bonds who uh, allegedly <laughs> uh, used uh, some stuff. And he was on the San Francisco Giants. And there was a um, – it all came out, and there was this guy named Victor Conti who, uh, who was the guy allegedly involved. So here's my friend Stan Conti, who was the trainer of the San Francisco Giants at the time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Conti is Conti that people are thinking. So basically, Stan had to keep introducing himself. Hi, I'm Stan Conti. I'm not related to Victor Conti. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yeah, that was just absolutely hilarious for me. Who's <laughs> next? Uh, I'd like to keep all that in the past, please. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, uh, you got a mic. We have a microphone. We'll we'll take this out into the. Okay. Uh, I was wondering whether any of you can or care to comment on the state of the Mike Marshall theories <laughs> on pitcher injuries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know. Take that one. I, I know Mike, Dr. Marshall. Um, he. Uh, you know, basically he has his own theory of how to pitch, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, it's kind of like this uh, pushing pronation type of pitch type of thing and less body rotation. And so I, I talked to Mike, Dr. Marshall, about six years ago, and uh, I said, he said, oh, this is the right way, and he's very strong in his opinion that this is the right way and, and, and everything we're all doing, everything Major League's doing is not the right way, to paraphrase what he was saying. So. Uh, so he said he has a new way, and I, we were kind of open-minded about it because, you know, in sports, sports history is full of people coming out with new methods for long jumping or this or the ski jumping or whatever, and Fosbury flop. So it's like, yeah, maybe you, know, maybe you got something. That's fine. So uh, he brought some of his guys to my biomechanics lab who threw with his style, and we ran them through the biomechanics test and compared them against a database of, of typical uh, standard pitchers, and it didn't show up well. His mechanics did not, they were actually uh, more stressful and less velocity than the standard mechanics. And it was a small study and it doesn't prove it for sure, but it didn't really show me that it was a better way. And also the, then the truth, the, the fact that Major League Baseball is not full of guys doing that is also perhaps, uh, you know, maybe it's not better than the conventional pitching. Oh yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, he is passionate about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. A uh, quick question. These individual player records that you're reflective of and referred to in the past, will they include things like alcohol abuse, drug abuse, or who knows, even maybe someday gender preference? Is that a possibility? Um, Typically, like personal things are not included in the file. It's really a work-related file, so it's you know things that happen on the job. So typically, those items are not included. Um, and frankly, I don't think we want them included. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
So with Tommy John surgery staying pretty consistent even with medical advancements, what is the eventual goal of researching them? What do you mean? What do you mean is remaining pretty equal? What, pretty, what's pretty consistently around 22? You said a year besides 2000. Well, as far as the number of surgeries? Yeah. Well, I think the ultimate goal would be zero. Um, you know, as far as that goes, I think as we understand more things that cause the ligament to, to fail, uh, we may be able to prevent it. But you have to get the, the, the core foundational information first. And I think the, the, the common thread that we're all saying is that uh, we're all, we believe since 2010 for sure we are heading in the right direction because we're getting better data. I've given lectures on injury predictions over the years and I always start off with is medical is dirty data and that's what makes it so difficult to analyze. I think the data is getting better and with more data we'll be able to, to go into areas that we hadn't thought about before in regards to that. When you start thinking about the stress, the stress on the ligament, it also involves uh, where their foot plant is, what their dorsiflexion is, how they, how they generate force up the kinetic chain. Um, you know, we looked at this uh, with oblique injuries uh, that all of a sudden have, have doubled in the last three seasons for no apparent reason, and, w and what the causes of that and how we can prevent it. So I think, I think all this research is based on trying to get zero injuries. Now, of course, we won't get zero injuries, but that sure is our goal. And if we can reduce the number of Tommy John surgeries that are occurring, especially in our minor leagues, which we still, we're still collecting data on, on how many of those uh, occur, um, then we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to find something that will prevent these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. Up until about 30 years ago, it wasn't uncommon for pitchers to throw 275, maybe north of 300 innings. Now you never see that anymore. The perception is, is that there were fewer injuries back then, perhaps. Do you agree with that perception? And if you do, maybe why were there fewer injuries back in the 70s than maybe there are today? Well, this gets back to the same thing that we've talked about from the beginning, and that is if you don't have the data, you don't know what it was, uh, along with the old saying, the older you are, the better you were. Um, so it, it, um, when I talk to older players that were in the 60s, and I've had the chance to talk to a lot of them, like Sandy Koufax and Juan Marichal, um, uh, I think there are some other factors that go into this in regards to the ability to throw what they did. I think uh, uh, I'm going to go off on a slight tangent here. I'm sorry, but you know, there's there's a theory that people run around with that the, sh the shoulder was not designed to throw. It was designed to throw. Everything in the anatomy and the way it's structured is designed to throw. It may not have been designed to throw as hard as it can 120 times in a two-hour period or three-hour period. Uh, so uh, it may not be able to handle that much stress. Um, the other factors that get into it is the strike zone, uh, the, the, the talent pool, uh, the number of teams, uh, the culture uh, that Billy Bean cracked uh, with walks uh, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the objective was to hit to get on. You didn't walk to get on, you hit to get on. So they were swinging at more pitches, putting more balls in play. The, the idea of uh, a nine or 10 pitch uh, at bat it didn't exist back then. Um, and with the strike zone being more accurate, uh, I said that right, more accurate um, than the, the, the ability to walk is now a great offensive tool, uh, where before it wasn't. So you could throw those number of pitches uh, and also not throw as hard. When you talk to them, the, the last two or three batters weren't very good, they would ease up on those guys. I think here what we see is guys are throwing as hard as they can. When they throw a slider, they throw it as hard as they can. When they throw a fastball, it's as hard as they can, every pitch. So I think that has something to do with it. The last thing is the conditioning. We're conditioning them to throw 100, 105 pitches. And if you condition them to throw 105, you can't expect them to throw 200. They won't last because they're not conditioned to do that. Yeah, the, the one thing I'll stand standpoint of this out, but we've done a lot of studies on you know, the, the, his, the historical um, you know, quantifying what, what was done in a game over, over time. And we found that roughly 30 more pitches are thrown in a game today than they were thrown 40 or 50 years ago. Um, we don't have pitch by pitch data per se, but we can use a lot of metrics to, to kind of approximate it. And so to Stan's point, you know, nine inning game may have been, you know, 140 pitches, you know, or something back, you know, uh, today, where back then it would have been 120. 
you know, something like that. So when you look at innings, you got to just kind of normalize for things over time. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, guys may be throwing fewer pitches is because there's a lot more walks in the game today and, and more strikeouts for that matter. And when players were injured too, um, there wasn't really a disabled list situation. Their disabled list was there, but generally a guy who got hurt went home. And, and so there wasn't very many records that I can find on, on this. When we were looking at obliques, one of the things we were looking at with oblique injuries was, was this a new injury to baseball? Which makes no sense, by the way. There shouldn't be a new injury in baseball. It's played exactly the same way. Uh, so when we saw that, uh, we looked back at the, the records back, back to 1991 and, and found that they were called other things, but they did in fact ha happen. And what led me to this was Davy Lopes. And Davy said, oh yeah, I got one of those back in 1970-whatever he, he played in. You know, and they call it a rib cage, they didn't call it an oblique. And so it, these, these injuries did happen, I'm sure of it, that we just didn't have records. Over here? One of the more interesting developments in the offseason was the Baltimore Orioles announcing two signings and then backing off because supposedly they failed their physical, which caused a lot of buzz about motivation, et cetera, et cetera, from the media. Uh, any thinking about Major League Baseball and the Players Union about maybe having the process change on this? Maybe they shouldn't announce until the players are signed. Do you see this as an issue or as a problem? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there's a lot of discussion about that. One of the issues is that, you know, it's not necessarily that it's announced, it's that it gets leaked out. And so that's sort of difficult to control, especially in this Twitter world that we're in. And so, you know, I think we've been working with, with them on these various issues over time, the Players Association. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult in this area. It's difficult in a lot of areas in terms of controlling information because all it takes is one person to get access to something and then once it's out, it's out. And so... It's difficult for the player, it's difficult for the club, it's difficult for everybody, um, and it's just a tough thing to manage, for sure. Um, a quick follow-up on that. Uh, one thing I've heard from some people suggesting that at the beginning of the offseason, all potential free agents undergo a physical at the beginning of the offseason, uh, and then they go through the signing period, and the physical would have already been addressed before then. How would that be impractical? Yeah, I mean, it's, the, the problem is just that if you're a player, you know, you don't want to... Maybe 75% maybe of them would be willing to do that, but maybe not all of them for various reasons. Maybe they're not healthy at the beginning of this you know, offseason, but they will be a month or two later. And so there's just a lot of nuances to that type of rule. I mean, I think anytime you legislate something, it creates situations where it works for a good portion of people, but not others. And it's just a tough area. I think, I think again, we're talking about analytics in the injury space evolving. I think you know, in injuries in general is an area that will evolve over time as... We, we get more information electronically. You, know, you talk about a lot of the things that are happening nationwide with regards to healthcare. I think that'll help us improve the way we handle injuries with players from an administration standpoint. I think it's just, it'll just take time to evolve. I, I wouldn't like that. Uh, from okay. our club standpoint, uh, there's too much that happens in the off season. I'd rather have the physical before, right before the contract. Stepping on a cactus, tripping over the dog, mm -hmm. carrying up meat, tripping on the stairs. We've heard those stories. And there's a lot of players who, who get by to the end of the season, are free agents, and then um, they can get through that physical. Uh, so I'd, I'd rather see them as close to when we sign them as possible. But, you know, Buster, on that, I, I've heard people ask about that also. About, and the model is the NFL, where they have the NFL combine. And uh, the question was, can baseball have a uh, baseball combine? physical exam and, and performance and everything. And what I hear from the baseball people is it wouldn't work because of the scheduling about the players who were signed or just finishing up their high school or college season. Chris, you, you, you're shaking your head that yeah. basically baseball wouldn't work for the scheduling. Yeah, it's, anytime you have, a, you know, every other sport, the players sign in the off season in terms of the amateur players. And so, it, whereas baseball is the only sport where they sign sort of in the middle of a season. And so it just creates a lot of different issues with high school versus college versus other types of players and international players and things like that. It's just it's a very difficult situation in terms of timing. The idea is you want to get guys, as soon as they're done playing, and get them into the system as quick as possible. So the system is beneficial from that regard because you can get a guy who plays in college, finishes up in June, he's on a major league field in July, and gets two or three months of, of professional experience in a year rather than waiting until the following season. Um, but it just creates some issues for, for, for medical stuff, for sure. I think we got time for one more quick one over here. With Kyle, with Kyle Zimmerman and Ike Davis dealing with injuries caused by their own workout regimens off-season, 
how are teams dealing with that, trying to make sure players aren't injuring themselves on their own unmonitored workouts? Did you guys hear that? Yeah, I think so. It's the personal trainer on the offseason that's right. caused the injuries. Um, well, I think every team works very, very hard to keep track of every player uh, that's under their control uh, during the offseason. Um, a lot of teams will open up their facilities, uh, especially their spring training facilities, uh, in Phoenix here, especially because a lot of players live in Phoenix, in the Phoenix area, so uh, and keep their, their, their weight rooms and their medical open all year long. Um, but um, you can't control the players all the time. Uh, Major League Baseball has put some uh, um, regulations in in regards to them going to see different doctors without the player, the team knowing. But in regards to the personal trainers, uh, one of the strategies that's used by a lot of teams is that uh, you'll talk with that personal trainer and try to get them on the program that you want. Uh, but it's still pretty much a crapshoot in regards to what's happening. We try to see our players at different intervals during the off season to see where they're at. Uh, but some of those are inter